What's up guys, welcome back to my channel. It's your boy Al in the building and I'm back with another video. So in today's video, it's a new series on my channel. So basically what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be inviting people from different fields in tech, engineering, and we're gonna be discussing career paths, advice for students that are confused about what to do when they graduate from school. Because as a student, and especially like me right now, it's really easy to be confused on what to do with your degree or like what to do in the future. Hopefully throughout this series you can find something that might interest you after you graduate. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this first episode and please let me know which disciplines or industries or companies you would like to see represented on these interviews in the future and I hope you guys enjoy this first episode. So I'm here with Ronke, who graduated from Carnegie Mellon in 2014. And today we're just going to be talking about her career so far as an engineer and like any advice she has for aspiring engineering students. So the first thing I want to ask is, why did you decide to study civil engineering? Okay, so it's, it's difficult because when you're in high school, you don't really exactly know what engineering is, right? For me, it started with The Inconvenient Truth. It basically was a movie that Al Gore, um, the previous VP of Bill Clinton, that he uh, put out. And basically what happened was I watched this in high school and I, I believe at the time I was a sophomore in high school and I was just like, oh my God, the world is coming to an end. We're treating our earth so terribly. This is, this is bad. Like I want to do whatever I can to try to improve the environment. So I became uh, more environmentally conscious after watching this film. I joined my high school's green team and we would do like little uh, sustainability projects around campus. Long story short, I, ended up settling on engineering because I was like, I'm not as artistic as I am analytical. I'm good at math, I'm good at science, and duh, that's what you need to be an engineer. I did a whole bunch of research, honestly. I did a lot of research, and the one thing I will say that I, I don't think I fully grasped or I understood at the time, but I'm really, really grateful for um, now is that I was like, well, if I change my mind, there's a lot of options. Civil engineering is a very broad engineering field. Project management falls under there. Construction falls under there. Um, building design falls under there. Transportation engineering falls under there. Environmental engineering falls under there. So I knew that I wanted something with a level of diversity because I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do. So that's basically how I came to the decision of civil engineering. I can relate to you when you say that you wanted to pick a major that's kind of like broad because it's kind of hard when you're in high school to know what you want to do for the rest of your life. One thing I do want to say, I'm going to interrupt you really quickly, is you said okay. it's difficult to choose like what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And that's the way a lot of, previously, that's the way the previous generation has translated what a career means, is that you pick what you want to do, you pick what you're passionate about, and you pursue that your entire life. So if you want to be an engineer, you're going to do that your entire life. That's what they used to do because the corporate structure was very different. It was very focused on like pensions and longevity. However, it changed and no one informed us of that. You can pick something and change your mind and change your path, it's okay. Like, you don't have to actually know what you wanna do for the rest of your life. You don't have to do the same thing for the rest of your life. That's the one thing I just wanna say. That's inspiring because a lot of us don't know what we wanna do with the rest of our lives. Like I'm in my third year and like, I'm still kind of confused, but we're gonna all eventually get there. I'm still <laughs> confused and I'm almost 30. Well, I'm 27. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it is definitely. okay, yeah. So fast forward, you graduated from Carnegie Mellon 2014. Your first job when you graduated from college was was it Schlumberger? Am I saying that right? Schlumberger. Schlumberger. Oh, and that's an oil and gas company. Yes. In a nutshell, that experience, I was a field engineer actually. So field engineering within the oil and gas space is going to be a little different than if you're behind a desk. And Schlumberger, the one thing I will say that's really good about that company is that they hire all disciplines of engineering. By the time I was graduating college, I decided that energy was something that I was more interested in. And I wanted to get an understanding of the oil and gas sector before moving on to clean energy because, again, the environmental aspect of things. So I got hired on and it was tough. So it was tough for a couple of reasons. The first reason was because uh, a little bit after I joined the company, they were laying off people. Oil prices tanked. Oil production was significantly increasing. So long story short, 
increase in supply, no increase in demand, the prices dropped and they started like laying off people. And I'd only been there like three months. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I, can't, I just got a job, I just graduated. But that experience was amazing. Uh, working as a field engineer was tough because all of like just oil and gas field work in general, it's, it's like a, a brotherhood. And I specifically said a brotherhood because women don't really work in the field. I was one of two female engineers. So on a field or a job, you're having anywhere, anywhere between 20 and 30 people, and they're pretty much all men. I'm the only woman. The way the schedule works, you're going out on location for two weeks at a time. You're working 12 hour shifts. Every other rotation, you're working nights. So it's a very intense um, field. It was a very intense time period. And this being my first job, it, 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 was, it was a little tough, but because coming from college, we did all nighters and and all of that, it was it was a good transition because if someone asked me to do it now, no. That work-life balance was not something that I would go back to. Slumberger is very big on training. So they, you get to, you go to a training school for about like a month and a half to two months. And you're, you go to two over your three year period as a field engineer. And so my first school, I was able to pick Abu Dhabi. So I was in the UAE um, near Dubai and it was a really fun experience. I got to travel and everything. So that part kind of gave me, made me okay with the suffering that I was going through. But it was definitely an intense, um, an intense job. And so eventually about a year into my job, I did get laid off, but I was so excited. And I had saved up money because like I said, with the uncertainty, I knew that I could be laid off at any time. So, and those are things that you'll get faced with that like throughout your career and whether you basically sell out yourself, sell out your peace and your happiness. Um, and sometimes you have to, but that's why it's so, or it's so important to like save your money when you're younger in your career, because then you can have the, what they call the F you money to be able to say, hey, I don't want this anymore. <laughs> Those oil and gas salaries are really tempting though, because especially for like chemical engineers. If you are a petroleum engineer, it's probably easier to get a higher salary out of college. But with the field engineering side of things, you start out as a trainee. And then when you break out, as we call it, then you can start gain getting bonus. Bonus is not guaranteed though. So when I first started as a trainee, I was making 70. Okay. which is okay it's not bad but for the hours I, I was working not amazing uh but it was with the promise that hey when you break out you're gonna be making 130 140 150k but I'm also working longer hours and I'm not enjoying what I'm doing it doesn't matter so yeah it's not necessary I never got to see that six-figure money in oil and gas because I got laid off before I broke out so <laughs> it depends so what are some like tips or advice you would give to students that want to pursue a job or career in the oil and gas field? Because I know in a lot of my comment sections and a lot of videos I see about chemical engineering, a lot of people want to go into that industry. Really? So what would yeah. you say? What I will say is um, 10, 15, you know, 20 years ago, it was definitely very lucrative. Just understand if, you, if this is something you really do want to go into, it is volatile. It's a volatile um, field now because it's just the, the prices of oil and the demand it goes up and down, you know, as we see during co the COVID pandemic, because people aren't driving as much, prices significantly drop. So of course, you know, they did a bunch of layoffs. So just keep that in mind. And if it's something you still want to do, just kind of be prepared with that. Maybe think about kind of other options, other ways to kind of secure your income, be a little bit more conservative and safe just in case. Um, and then in terms of actually entering the field, there are a few different options. You know, the Exxons are great, but they're hard to get into. They want you to have at least a 3.5 GPA and all these other things. But a company like Schlumberger, for example, didn't care. I had over three on. They were like, you're great, you're perfect. So a Schlumberger could be a good pathway and just know it's, it is going to be a lot of work. Um, it's going to be a little uncomfortable for some people, but it, um, it was an experience that I would never take back for me. I honestly, for me, the biggest mistake I think that I made was not being as open-minded as I could have been. I had this idea of the path that I was supposed to take to the ideal career that I was supposed to have, and I wasn't flexible on the path. I decided what it was going to be, but that's not how life works. Like a lot of times people who are very successful and are the 
the CFOs of a company or like all those people, they didn't necessarily specifically decide this was the path that I was going to take to get there. They had their goal and they did the work they needed to do and whatever opportunity or door opened up is what is how they kind of like decided and determined the path. But I always tried to decide my path. So I told myself, oh, I'm going to do oil and gas and then, oh, I'm going to go into clean energy. And then it didn't work out that way. And it would kind of frustrate me. And so eventually you just kind of like letting go of that and just kind of allowing things to kind of naturally or organically come and then filtering, but still doing the work that I needed to do allowed even more opportunity to come because my path was limited by my own imagination. But when you kind of let go, you realize that, oh my God, it could be so much better. Another mistake I would probably say that I've made is not always knowing my worth. So my the jobs that I took, there weren't always options for negotiation. So my first job, there was an option to negotiate because it's, it's formulaic. The second job, it was a nonprofit. Again, there was no opportunity for negotiation. My third job, I negotiated a little and it worked, but I think that because I was making my resume really broad, and applying to just a bunch of jobs, it wasn't really returning the way I wanted it to. So I kind of felt like, oh, well then I need to just accept whatever, I'm okay with this amount or I'm okay with that amount. So I think that's like the other mistake. I didn't really always do the best job of catering my resume to my skills. I kind of just put on my resume what I thought would be good to get me that job that I thought I wanted. And again, because I wasn't open, I was, there was letting a lot of good jobs probably pass me by that probably would have been better suited. How do you go about like finding your passion for like, for like engineering tech or like just the job in general? Because that is so hard to like, separate. Yeah. yeah, it's something that a year or two ago, I, I don't think I would have been able to properly answer. Uh, the COVID pandemic really forced me to do reflection. So in terms of finding the, your purpose, there were a few different activities that I personally did. One, journaling. Writing down your thoughts, writing down your ideas, and just how you feel is really good because you can go back and read it and be like, oh, okay. And you know, you'll start seeing like things that you didn't, you don't notice because if you, if it's just a thought and it remains up there, you forget. Versus if you write it down, you can go back and reflect on it. Two, it's called passion planning or something along those lines. It's like a diagram that you're creating. And basically what I did was I wrote my interests in bubbles and it'd be, for example, travel, networking, energy, and technology. I put like those bubbles and then events because I, on the side, I would always like host events, like for friends and sometimes with like organizations. So those were the things that I noticed. It was like, but why do I enjoy having events? Because I enjoy bringing people together. So I was able to kind of go back and figure out not just the passion, but my purpose, because you can be passionate about certain things, but your purpose is, is different. And so your passion can be your hobby and your purpose can be something else. And you just kind of incorporate your passion and the things you enjoy into that. And I tried to figure out what connected it all. And I realized that what connected it all for me was, again, bringing people together was kind of the overall thing in one way, shape or form. It, it was bringing people together and also um, educating and kind of motivating, inspiring people. And so I was like, oh, okay, now that I know that, how can I tie that into the things that I do? So I, I feel like those activities were really helpful. And I'll, um, after the interview, I'll send you like a couple links so you can include it in the YouTube description so people can kind of actually click on it and get a better understanding of what it looks like. But those two things were really powerful. Okay, so as we're nearing the end of the interview, which thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. Like this has been an awesome interview for the first one, for the first episode. Thank you. So the final thing I want to end this video off with, I mean, my YouTube channel is about like giving advice to like engineering students and like this anybody interested in STEM in general. Yeah. So what are like your final pieces of advice that you'll give to engineering students or like students? I would say it's if it's something you think you're interested in, definitely look into it. I'm a big proponent of the STEM field because I'm a, and I'm a testament. I'm starting to navigate outside of the traditional STEM path, but it's still so beneficial. It's really given me 
additional ways to think and to go about how I solve things and how I, how I look at problems even. If you can find someone who is a little older than you, uh, reach out to them and just ask questions because what you think engineering is, is not what it is. They're just a bunch of misconceptions. A lot of people don't know what engineering is. So it, it can be helpful to speak to somebody who's upper an upperclassman or somebody who's a few years removed. If you don't know anyone, don't be embarrassed or feel awkward about reaching out to someone on LinkedIn. Just be genuine. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If this video added value to you, subscribe down below. And please drop a comment down below if you have any questions. And if there's any other industries, disciplines, or specific companies that you would like to see represented, please comment them down below. And I'll see you in the next one.